Good morning. Today is the fifth Sunday of Lent. Next week is Palm Sunday. Today, I greet you with these words from John's Gospel. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. We come today in both service and praise to God our Father and His Son, Jesus. I am so glad you are here with us today. We'll begin our worship this morning with the call to worship, which has been the same all through Lent, Turn Our Eyes Upon Jesus. Our gathering prayer this morning is going to be a video it's called Rain, a Prayer for Lent. It comes to us from Freebridge Media. Rain down on me, almighty God. Shower me with your grace. Flood me with your mercy. For I am a dry and barren land consumed by the rot of my sin, burdened beneath the weight of my transgressions. Pour out your loving kindness. Drench my heart with your presence. Renew my soul, refresh my purpose, reignite my passion. Rain down on me as I own my iniquities. Rain down on me as I humbly confess. Rain down on me as I enter your presence. Rain down on me, Almighty God. Our opening hymn this morning is God of Love and God of Power. Sing along. Lent, and part of Lent means confessing, and today we will offer a prayer of confession. Perhaps you will know part of it as it comes from our hymnal and has often been part of the communion liturgy. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Hear now these words of assurance. In the grace of God, through the love of Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are saved from brokenness and sin and are restored to the joy of God's salvation. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inner inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. An actor plays the part of Jesus, and though no actor is worthy of such a role, It has been done so that we may understand and benefit from the life of Jesus. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip. He was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. And the two of them went and told Jesus. The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I'm telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honor anyone who serves me. Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me. But that is why I came. 
so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. It is not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. Our next hymn this morning is Just As I Am Without One Plea. Sing along. talking about changing course all through Lent. We've talked about Lenten practices and about faith and righteousness, how they go hand in hand. We've talked about praying and doing for others. We've talked about cleaning up the clutter in our lives. I referenced that some of the clutter in our lives comes from our sins. Surely it's very true that Christ died for our sins, but there's way more to that than just believing Christ died for our sins. That doesn't really change our course a whole lot. Not really. Knowing it and believing it are all very well and good, but that knowing and believing can sort of take away any responsibility on our parts. Surely for us, 
to have entry into heaven, we need to do our part. And according to our readings this morning, our part includes confessing. We don't do a whole lot of confessing in church services. In fact, some people think confessing isn't really a Methodist thing. Confession has always been part of the Lenten practices in most churches, and it's not just a Catholic thing either because there are prayers of confession in our hymnal. And just because I've not used them since I've been here doesn't mean they aren't Methodist-ish. So I've not made them part of our service here at church, and I have to ask myself, why is that? Why don't I lead us in prayers of confession? I didn't have a good answer for that, so as you noted, We've used one this morning, as we should. That should be a course that we get on and stay on. Prussian King Frederick the Great understood about confession, about it being the right thing to do. He was once touring a Ber Berlin prison. The prisoners fell on their knees before him to proclaim their innocence, except for one man who remained silent. And Frederick called to him, why are you here? Armed robbery, your majesty, was the reply. And are you guilty, asked King Frederick. Yes, indeed, your majesty, I deserve my punishment. Frederick then summoned the jailer and ordered him, release this guilty wretch at once. I will not have him kept in a prison where he will corrupt all the fine, innocent people who occupy it. That is quite a story because it gives us something to learn about confession Confession is not only good for the soul, but clearly it changes things for the confessor. This prisoner's confession changed the course of his life. Don't you wish, as you watch the news night after night, that people would just confess their wrongs, say, yep, I did that, and nope, that wasn't right, and I did wrong. Mm, don't you just wish. But are we quite ready to do that honest confessing ourselves? Mm, perhaps not. Our grandchildren, Sydney and Andrew, are being raised Catholic, which is great. They are being raised in the church, so we really don't care which one. But last year, Andrew, who is now nine years old, had to do his first reconciliation. And near as I can figure, that means it's the first time he had to go to confession. He was a wreck. He asked his mom to help him decide what to tell the priest, what to confess of the things he did wrong. Which sin should he confess? He was really worried about it. As an aside, apparently that's not so unusual. I read about that similar thing in this little story. Because the younger children at a parochial school often forgot their sins when they entered the priest's confessional, the priest suggested that teachers have the students make lists. So the next week when one child came to confession, the priest could hear him unfolding paper and the youngster began, I lied to my parents, I disobeyed my mom, I, forgot, I fought with my brothers and and there was a long pause. Then a little angry voice said, hey, this isn't my list. Andrew's list was collated. He took a few days to finish it. Not because it was so very long, thank God, but because it was tough telling his mom his wrongs. I guess it gave him good practice. He did say things like this. Remember when you asked me if I had chewed on my pencil and I told you no? Well, I did really. And he said, one time you called my name when I was downstairs and I didn't answer, but then I told you that I didn't hear you. Well, I really did hear you. Confession to mom turned out to be much harder than to someone he couldn't see on the other side of the door. But today's lessons, at least a couple of them, remind us to confess our sins. First, Psalm 51, King David is the psalmist. It is believed he wrote this after his affair with Bathsheba and his horrible plan to have her husband killed once David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant. Talk about a reason to change course and confess. There's nothing right about what he did. So he really needed to confess. He asked for mercy. He asked God to erase his transgressions. He wished God would wash him, make him whiter than snow, January snow, not March snow. I love this line, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. What a wonderful line. And for me, it's a nice way to start a prayer of confession. I remember clearly from the last book study, Before Amen, by Max Lucado, that he wrote about confession. It was about praying specifically, which I touched on last week. Confess like Andrew, 
like the prisoner in Berlin. Name it and own it. Say it clearly no matter how much you hate it. In that book study, we talked about admitting our sins and how it's, it's hard to do. And we even stated it is somewhat, somewhat easier to name our sins of omission than to name our sins of commission. Sins of omission are what we did wrong simply because we didn't do what was right. That the ought to haves, the should haves, are not as awful as the dids for some reason. At least that's what we think. Sadly, that isn't the case probably for God. God says, don't sin. Confess the sins and change course. That's the harder part, the part after the hard work of confessing. It's one thing to say what we did wrong. It's the harder part in most cases to stop doing it another time. This somewhat funny story illustrates that perfectly. Four preachers met for a friendly gathering, and during the conversation, one preacher said, our people come to us and pour out their hearts, confess certain sins and needs. Let's do the same. Confession is good for the soul. In due time, all agreed. One confessed he liked to go to movies, even ones that are not good for the soul. He would sneak to a movie theater in another town so as to not be seen. The second confessed to liking to smoke cigars and to drink alcohol, sometimes to excess, sometimes after preaching how bad those things are to his folks. The third one confessed to playing cards and being quite good at it, often winning the gambled money from his fellow players. When it came to the fourth one, he wouldn't confess. The others pressed him saying, come now, we confessed ours, confess to us. What is your vice? What is your sin? Finally, he answered, it is gossiping and I can hardly wait to get out of here. There you have it. Confession that's hardly worth the words spoken. It's admission, but with no intent to change. And that change thing, that's been the talk for the last five weeks, change course. So why bother to ask to be whiter than snow? Why God, ask God to hide his face from our sins? Why say and believe that no matter what we do, what kind of sin we, we commit, the sin really is against God, why do all that heart work if in the end we just do it and do it again? Confession brings us to a better relationship with God. The purpose of confessing is to connect with the one who laid down his life for us so we could live our life for him. When we confess something, it's probably because we've been doing what pleases us, what we wanted to do with little regard for what pleases God and what he would like us to do. Think about that. When you confess, isn't it clear that you are confessing, that what you are confessing is probably what disappointed God the most? Confession is a topic of many verses in the Bible. That's because it's been a problem forever, right from the start, with Adam and Eve and the forbidden fruit. It's been a thing. Here are just a few verses for us to remember. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Leviticus 5.5, 5, when anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. Matthew 3.2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The benefits of confessing? Well, First, in the admission of our guilt, it's not like you are telling God anything he doesn't already know. But when we say it, 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 it surely becomes ours. God already knows our sins, but he wants us to know our sin as well. Own it. Lying to ourselves and God will get us no place. We all sin. We can't help it. We are human. So after we've confessed, admitted, we are reminded that God's grace is there for us. We get God's forgiveness even though we don't deserve it. We can again be joyful according to King David once we've named our sins. King David prayed, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. So telling God won't surprise him, at least not about the act, but maybe the way we say it will be unexpected if we try to make it sound less sinful. But once we say it, we own it. Next, we can move forward on a new course, and we should. 
A man told his pastor he had done a terrible thing and could find no rest for his conscience. And the pastor asked him, have you confessed it to the Lord? And the man replied, pastor, I've confessed that sin a thousand times. And the wise pastor said, that is 999 times too many. You should confess it once and praise God a thousand times for his forgiveness. Remember that, remember, and then remember this next verse, as I know you've heard it a hundred times. 1 John 1, 9, from the Good News Translation. But if we confess our sins to God, he will keep his promise and do what is right. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our wrongdoing. The prophet Jeremiah tells us a similar thing. God said, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So let it go. Confess and move on to a new course. And the new course better include work on avoiding that particular sin. And finally, our new course is on a better path. We are aware because we've lived with the words of our confession. We are aware of what the sin we committed did to us, how it kept us from living fully into the grace of God. So once we've confessed and we've committed to a new course, it's like a restoration, a reformation, a reboot or a reset. Again, we've talked about Lent being a time to repent and return to God. And in that repentance, we really do return back to God. It's about the relationship we have with him, and we don't ever want to lose that. Sometimes my English teacher head needs or wants a formula for some things, formulas like science and math formulas. And lucky for me, and now you, if you are formulaic as well, crosswalk.com gives us a formula for a good prayer of confession. Try this if you think you might stumble when you start confessing your sins. Begin by praying that you do indeed want to have a humble and contrite heart. Begin by stating how sorry you are to come again to God in confession, not that he wasn't expecting it. Then acknowledge the specific sin. Maybe you were resentful of someone, or maybe you are holding a grudge, or maybe you lied a little bit. Name it and claim it. Next, affirm God's character. Remind yourself by stating all the ways you know God is good. Affirm for yourself that you know he is all loving and all compassion. Then affirm your belief that he forgives and that he will not act like humans act. That he forgives us if we ask him. And then finally, assure him that you believe that. Finish strong. Perhaps you can start with create in me a clean heart and finish with I know you are faithful and just to always forgive my sins. You've not only confessed, but you've used his own words to do it. Perfect. So Lent is a time of repentance and confession as well as prayer and fasting and giving. And we are on a good course when we continue to try harder to be more Christ-like week after week. Good thing, because we're coming so close to the cross. It's two weeks away. This whole time is a time for us to get out of our wilderness places and our darknesses and to become more like Jesus. Lent is good. We need to be as well. Confession is part of that. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious and patient God, we come before you with so many things which weigh us down. We would like an easy faith, one that doesn't cause us to look within ourselves to identify those many ways in which we have forsaken you. But faith is never easy. It requires our very souls. Forgive us, God, for all those things which we have neglected to do that would have helped someone else to be closer to you. Heal our hearts from the wounds which have been inflicted upon us by the anger and misunderstandings which occur in relationships. And prepare our lives to be of service to you. We long for your presence and your healing touch. As we approach Easter, we are rushing headlong into the holiday and we are drawn to planning for that day. We feel a sense of urgency, and yet you have called us to be on this journey through Lent, gradually coming with Christ to the cross and beyond. Slow us down. Help us to look more closely at our own lives, at the many ways in which they are driven and demands are placed upon them. Remind us again of the ministry and mission of Christ, who came that we might have life. We have offered prayers for family and friends, for situations near and far, and we have asked for your help, healing, and blessing. Make us ready to receive these precious gifts and walk with us on this pathway. We ask 
for your special healing on our friends and neighbors. We're thankful, God, for the many blessings in our lives. Help us look at the blessings more than the barriers that have prevented us from following you. Guide us that we may become stronger in our faith and our service to you. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And this version comes from the band, Mercy Me. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died My richest gain I count but loss In poor content on all my now this benediction. We can change our minds. And when we do, it changes the way we feel. And when we change the way we feel, it changes the way we act. When we change the way we act, it changes our corner of the world. Lent is a time for us to change course. Today and this week, let God show you the way. Amen. Join now in our postlude, the last verse of I Come With Joy. (laughs) 